This is a man who needs no introduction. Uh, he brought us way back in the day, Anchor, the preeminent open source framework to write Solana programs in Rust that's still widely used to this day. Uh, he brought us Mad Lads um, earlier this year. He brought us the Backpack Wallet, the XNFT standard, and now the most recent announcement and centralized exchange called Backpack Exchange. Um, Armani Ferrante, thank you so much for joining us. This has been on the docket basically since we launched the show. I think you're actually going to be our first guest way back in April. And incidentally, that was the day Mad Lads was dropping or around that time. Things got super hectic, and six months later, we're finally getting around to rescheduling you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, that was a great introduction. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super happy to finally be here, I suppose, after six months. It sounds horrible when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got we to gotta get the receipts out. We got to make sure people know. <laughs> but no, I think the timing is funny, too. It's like back then you were just launching. I mean, just Mad Lads on its own is... It, it broke. It's either going to flip D Gods or it already did uh, to top across all chains. Top NFT collection will probably be kind of the juggernaut of Solana. Um, and now, I mean, that feels like an eternity ago. That was only in April. And here we are, uh, you know, ex FTX engineer trying to take another stab at a centralized exchange. I mean, that that's a journey that I think in a storyline, a lot of people are getting really dug into. And I think it's super interesting. Um, obviously, the, to the untrained eye, it feels like a lot of different types of projects and, and things. Um, but from your perspective, like, how does this all tie together? The wallet, the standards, the, the NFT side, as well as now a central exchange. How does this all tie together to a unifying vision? Yeah, yeah. Super, super good question. So we really started the company or the uh, Coral off of the back of all of the open source work that I had done when coming into Solana in September 2020. So for about that, that entire year, um, September 2020 to about December 2021, you know, worked on a bunch of different stuff, you know, wallets, um, DeFi, and developer tooling, as you, as you mentioned in that beautiful introduction. And that was stuff was pretty successful, and the network really started growing uh, pretty exponentially, and Solana really started blossoming into this incredible network. And I think a lot of people at the time were just kind of looking at me and were basically saying, "Armani, keep doing this." <laughs> um, and, and so we, we created the company basically from a lot of that encouragement. I mean, to be honest, it was we didn't really have like, you know, a specific goal at the time other than, well, let's just make useful things in crypto. I think there was a lot of important problems to solve at the time. A lot of, you know, in crypto, honestly, there's just all these things to do where you look around the world and you're wondering, well, why aren't people doing this stuff? And so we thought, okay, well, you know, we can get some resources, hire some awesome devs and, and, and build a nice organization to tackle some of these problems. And so that was really like the starting point. It was really December, 2021, when I, I you know, started you know, figuring out how to how to build this company. And really the starting point, I mean, there's a bunch of kind of ideas I was like going through at the time. And, and really the first big idea that I was really gung ho and excited about was XNFTs, where the idea is really simple. Instead of tokenizing images, or really in addition to tokenizing images, we can tokenize code. And off of that very simple primitive, we can build, you know, a, a next generation wallet, and with those two things, we can really build a next generation Web3 native crypto, you know, application ecosystem, kind of like a, a Web3 iOS Android, if you want to put it kind of in, in those terms. You know, Saga was, was, was uh, you know, being developed at the time and we were building this kind of more or less at the exact same time. And so we, we kind of thought this was a really awesome idea and, you know, decided to go forward through it, with it. And, but it was really from the perspective of on-chain applications and really the wallet as the vehicle to distribute those applications. And, you know, it was an NFT protocol and we thought, well, what better way to build the product than to eat our own cooking? Why don't we just build an NFT project? Because it's one thing to build for other people. Um, it's another thing to build for yourself and to really intimately understand the process of what it's like to build one of these NFT communities. And so we kind of looked around at the space at the time. We thought, okay, well, I think we can do it. 
Um, I, th- I, I really felt, I mean, not to sound too, too confident or, or, or too, too egotistical, to be honest, but I really felt like we could do it. I, I don't know why, I just really felt like uh, we could build a good NFT project. And um, XNFTs were the perfect vehicle to do it. And so that's really where those three things kind of kind of came from. So we decided to, to launch Mad Lads. It was really product motivated. And then, you know, obviously in September of, or excuse me, uh, I'm getting my times mixed up, November, November of, of, of I guess, 2022. Is that, is that, that's when the world collapsed. <laughs> uh, that, um, it was really um, on the flight back home from, from Lisbon, from Breakpoint, uh, we were in the Solana conference, you know, giving talks on on you know XNFTs and what we were building, and um, that's, that's really when we learned, alongside the rest of the world, you know, the catastrophe at FTX and all the horrible things that happened there. And it was really kind of you know from that point until the launch of Mad Lads about six months ago, we were really just heads down, tunnel visioned, thinking about how to survive the next day. It was really uh, a defining moment, I think, for us and honestly, just for, for a, a ton of people in the industry. And it was really about just staying alive. I think uh, I think it was the block that described, I think I described it as, as, as cockroach mode. We were in cockroach mode. And, and to be honest, we were just, uh, it was just, it was, it was crazy. It was chaos. It was stressful in so many ways. And it wasn't until we launched Mad Lads where we, we hit that milestone we launched Mad Lads, we launched XNFTs, we launched Bad Backpack, and we really stopped and, and really reflected on the world um, because you know we, you know we, we hit those milestones. We we were alive. The company didn't collapse. We still maintained a lot of the core team, and it was that point we really reflected a bit and stopped and and thought, okay, well, the world is obviously so different in a million different ways, and it wasn't just FTX. It was also the traditional, you know banking system that was having problems, right? SF, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, there was the USDC DPEG, <laughs> um, that the, yeah. there was all these banks that were having issues and were getting, you know, acquired um, instability kind of throughout the system or the worry of, of it at least. And I think it was, and so like the world was just a very different time or in a very different place than when we first started the company and we thought, okay, well, like how should we adjust course? And there was a bunch of exchanges really being started up at the time. And, you know, as an engineer, I felt very confident in the engineering side of things. I felt felt very confident in the product side of things. I felt very confident in the marketing side of things. And I was like, okay, well, I could do those things. The things that I cannot do um, that I know nothing about is, is compliance. It's international law. It's the crazy complexity that is involved with building one of these financial institutions, not just in the U.S., but all around the world. And so really the, the magical moment was when, you know, I met my, my partner, um, Ken, um, we were basically, we, we've known each other for quite a long time and he, we basically talked to each other and he was told me a bit about what he was doing. He was really kind of working with regulators around the world, helping various exchanges get, get stood up, um, really figure, trying to figure out from the compliance point of view, how do we solve the, the FTX problem? And you know, it just made sense that, you know, I can come and, and, and help kind of alongside that journey. And eventually we basically decided, you know what, you know, I think with Backpack, we have an a, incredible brand, we have an incredible community. And then obviously he had the whole kind of expertise on the compliance side of things where I felt like together we can actually build one of these things properly. And uh, without him, we certainly would not be even attempting this, I think. You know, I think the days of building these exchanges that are not kind of under compliance um, or brought into compliance, I, I think those days are over. Um, and in order to build one of these institutions, you really have to do it right from so many different verticals, um, not only from the engineering side with all the cool kind of cryptography that we use, but also from the operation side, from the licensing side, from the regulatory side, from the legal side, from just the million different details that is involved with building an international financial institution. And that was really kind of the the point in which we pulled the trigger and decided, okay, I think we can make this happen. Let's let's build one of these things. And we were off to the races. Wow. What a fantastic uh, way to give us an overview of your entire journey. Uh, we appreciate that. Certainly a lot of topics we could get into. I think it makes sense to just start with 
the exchange. It's the most recent. Um, I think a lot of eyeballs are on that right now. And you brought up a lot of interesting points, which is that you're architecting this in a different way, in a way that's probably a little bit easier to give other stakeholders, auditors, just cu customers assurances that the funds are there, right? Just after FTX. I mean, that I can't believe we have to literally say that, but that is now a question with a lot of exchanges um, out in the crypto world. One question I want us to just start with is how hard is it to build an exchange? They, they've always felt to me like this just giant behemoth and impossibility. Uh, there's so much that happens behind the scenes to secure the assets, to you know, make the matching engine efficient and get liquidity uh, so that people have you know, decent access to a wide variety of assets at good prices in whatever size they want. Uh, and even just ignoring the compliance side, which is an entire burden in and of itself. I mean, tell us, like, what has it taken to get to this point where the exchange is about to be launched? How many people are, are working on this at, at your company? Um, give us the lowdown here. Yeah, it's an it's an enormous task. It's it's try. Everybody says it, but you know, every founder goes through the exercise of thinking, "Oh, yeah, it's simple. I can do it." And then they go through it, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, if I had known the journey I would have gone through uh, in order to get to this point, I would. I never would have done it." And and certainly, um, that applies to us. There's been tons of different challenges. I mean, the engineering side is certainly uh, what I find comfort comfort in. It's, it's something that I think is challenging, but I think something that I think we're lucky that we we're prepared for. Um, just you know, having been in the industry for so long. And I think, you know, we felt confident that we had the, the expertise to do it and the chops to do it. Um, but there's many different components. It's like a really unique mix of skills. So obviously there's the foundational set of skills where you just need, you know, solid engineers that can build, you know, a solid, uh, you know, um, uh, fast uh, performance system that can stay up all the time um, and, and, you know, have, you know, a low latency, high throughput and, and low jitter. Um, this is kind of like, you know, table stakes for building any exchange. Um, there's, you know, common techniques for building this stuff. I think it's more or less well known by, you know, the majority of engineers and, you know, Silicon Valley tech companies, you know, we know how to build these things. Um, but then on top of this, right, these kind of web two skills, I would describe them. Um, there is obviously the, the finance knowledge, right? Um, how do you build an order book? I mean, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, super, uh, well known, but it's also well understood by the people that are in the industry. Like we know how to build these things, right? We know the builder books, right? Um, but you know, then you get into more esoteric things like, well, how do you build a liquidation engine or a risk engine, right? You know, how do you calculate cross collateral and margin fractions and do this for a wide variety of assets and and have orderly liquidations that are fair um, and and robust and 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 and, and so that's uh, an interesting piece of knowledge. Uh, but then, you know, layering on top of all this is not just, you know, finance, but, well, you're in crypto, right? So there's also the domain-specific knowledge in, in the crypto space. Um, and what's really interesting about this is, well, you know, on, on the one hand, cryptocurrencies are so interesting because, well, they're verifiable, they're unforgeable, they're censorship resistant, you can't reverse a transaction. And this is what gives them the, these incredible properties for you know, transacting financial value. But on the other hand, from the perspective of building an exchange, it's an incredibly scary thing, right? You can think about something like a withdrawal. It sounds so silly, but a withdrawal is very scary. If you go through the user experience for any of the major exchanges, there's a reason why they make you jump through all these hoops, right? You have a, you know, email OTP, you have a 2FA app in addition to email and password, then maybe you might have a withdrawal password or some other kind of uh, authentication mechanism. And it's because when that withdrawal goes out, well, it's game over. So yeah. when the withdrawal goes out, well, you have to be certain that that is correct. And so we've put a lot of work purely into into that side of things as well. And so the way we built the whole system um, it is on, on top of the previous two kind of categories of things that I talked about. Well, you know, we also apply kind of modern techniques that are widely used in blockchains, right? You know, things like, uh, you know, state machine replication and having no single point of failure, right? We basically have these different validators that, uh, you know, independent instances of the exchange that all run in parallel. You can imagine all three of us were running our own versions of the exchange, um, where not only do we have computational integrity guarantees on the execution, but also all the validators control the custody solution as well. So if any one of us gets hacked, if any one of the validators gets hacked, then, well, we can detect that discrepancy, right? We can detect a malicious withdrawal and then stop the bad thing from happening. 
Um, and so you start layering on these type of techniques as well that are widely used in, in, in blockchains, right? And every message that goes into the system, right, every transaction in blockchain terms is um, authenticated. It's signed with an ED25519 key pair, right? So we have a, a globally kind of uh, ordered linear uh, authenticated log of, of messages that are ar archived and replayable um, so that we know for every state transition exactly how it occurred. Right. Um, and those private keys might come from us. We provide API keys or they might come from you where you can bring your own key pair, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, but it's effectively running its own mini private blockchain um, that kind of combines a lot of these techniques together uh, to have these nice kind of robust, robust like computational uh, integrity guarantees on the state of the exchange and the custody of the funds at any given point in time. And then on top of this, uh, <laughs> it's like never ending. On top of this, we uh, we are we've been working with Otter Security. So they're an incredible um, group of folks. They're one of the biggest auditors on Solana and, and crypto in general. They're uh, really um, awesome security engineers and, and security researchers. And we've been working with them to bring to market um, a new set of uh, zero knowledge proofs for reserves. So our goal basically is to have proof of reserves every single day where I can go into a web page, look at like a calendar UI, if you will, and just see all of my balances for every single snapshot where each snapshot, each proof is attested to on the blockchain every single day. And then I could pull up my phone or my extension or the website. I could literally go look at the verification code and run verification proofs where I can check, okay, yeah, that's right. The balance is in this in in the exchange system do map to the balances that are on the blockchain and that's really the point that we want to get to um and that's a really hard problem combining all these things three all these things these things together um to build kind of a next generation uh cryptocurrency exchange um and it really gets to the first principled reason for why blockchain technology is so interesting, right? It, it's purpose built for this stuff. And we're really excited to to apply it, not just to permissionless crypto networks, but now to a centralized financial institution. And so, yeah, that's kind of like the many layers from the engineering point of view. I'm just wondering how um, groundbreaking this is, because if you, from an outsider's perspective, who doesn't know very much about uh, building an exchange. Um, TradFi, it feels like the tech only goes up to a certain level. And then after that, uh, you're sort of relying upon these checks and balances, reporting to the various regulatory authorities. Then you had sort of the early crypto exchanges, Binance, things like that, where they basically had the same tech, as far as I can tell, as these um, TradFi exchanges, but they didn't have all of those checks and balances. It was more an unregulated market. And that's how we've sort of ended up with FTX. Whereas what, you, whereas what you're describing seems to be almost like the future of all exchanges, um, both crypto and TradFi, um, because you're now starting to leverage um, crypto techniques to, uh, to ensure the, the veracity, that the funds are there, that, um, that everything has been done uh, in accordance with the rules without having to rely upon this sort of three months uh, delayed reporting upon what's actually happened, which is, you know, a very inefficient system. Is, is that how you see it? Can this be the sort of the future of all exchanges? That's exactly right. I think this applies to not just crypto exchanges, it really applies to any system that's tracking a ledger, right? That is why blockchains are, are so interesting. Um, and it's it's really like the perfect technology for creating audit, auditable, verifiable, um, computational kind of uh, uh, systems. Right. Any, any, anything where you have this deterministic state transition function that can be computed from a authenticated stream of inputs um, that you can apply these techniques. Right. Um, and so totally agree with everything that you're saying. I think it's kind of funny because I don't on the one hand, it's, you say it's groundbreaking and, 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 and it is because, well, I'm, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's many crypto changes that are actually built like this. Um, maybe you can point at DEXs. DEXs certainly are the, are the closest thing um, because they're quite literally on a blockchain using smart contracts. Um, but on the other hand, it's like not particularly new stuff right it's just we're just doing it right it's like it's kind of like what i said in the beginning of the call right it's like you look around the crypto space you're like well why don't people do this stuff and it's like well you know a lot of the obvious things you know whether it's anchor whether it's mad lads whether it's xnfts and i guess now the exchange a lot of it's just like obvious right i wouldn't consider it like groundbreaking research or particularly insightful um although the the zero knowledge proof stuff is pretty um novel research but the general architecture i would not describe as groundbreaking um it's kind of just tried and true kind of stuff that we've known as a general kind of uh i don't know set of you know profession you know 
software professionals uh, and it's just like applying it to the domain in, in a way that I think is just appropriate. Um, and even in like traditional finance, like NYSE and like these kind of, you know, exchanges, they use a lot of these techniques, right? They use state machine replication and all these things. They just don't have the crypto part of it, right? They don't have the, the, the proofs and they don't have, you know, the independent validators and, and things of that nature. And that's why they have the uh, long settlement times, right? Versus when you use a blockchain, you have instant settlement. And you have, you know, consensus at the speed of life. You want to use the Solana tagline. Uh, and that's what makes it so awesome and also so scary and why you need a lot of these, you know, very kind of challenging uh, uh, modern crypto techniques to do that in a secure way. So I don't know what the future holds, but I'm super excited about all this stuff. And I think it's the future for sure. Where does this exchange fit into the competitive landscape and I guess the geographical landscape, which is to say, there's a lot of exchanges out there. It's been a tried and true business model for crypto. Um, but where's this slot into compared to, you know, your Binance's, Coinbase's, Kraken's, Bybit's, KuCoin's, OKX's of the world? Is there a specific market you're going to kind of focus on heavily first? Uh, specific fiat currencies that will be supported? Um, how does this kind of fit in? I think morally speaking, um, the way that we are, just oriented in the world it is pretty different than all of those institutions. I think we are primarily looking through the lens of the L1 itself, through the lens of self-custody as a wallet, through the lens of you know open source developers. Um, the exchange obviously is an open source, but I've spent a lot of time kind of you know working on on open source and 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 um, and that's pretty meaningful to me. And and, and I think. Yeah, I think just like morally speaking, I think we, we come at it from that point of view. The, the How do we build a great institution to build the broader crypto economy, right? Um, I think the role that exchanges play, I mean, everybody loves to talk about trading. I think trading super important. Definitely, it's super important. Don't get me wrong. Um, and, and we'll have a great trading product. Uh, but I, I, I view... The, the, the general role of the exchange is more of an auxiliary service to the, the, the L1. It, it's really this gateway or, or this bridge from the traditional financial system into the parallel financial system, and to put it in Anatoly's words. It's really that gateway, right? It, it, it's doing all that hard work of connecting to TradFi, doing all the compliance-led work, leg work integrating into that system in a way that will requires a ton of money. It requires a ton of compliance and expertise, tons of talent, tons of operational overhead and doing all this stuff all around the world, not just in one country, but in, you know, every country kind of on the planet. And that's a ton of work and somebody has got to do that. And, and then, you know, that unlocks a ton of value. Um, the first thing you get, right, is, as you mentioned, is just fiat. Um, and that's probably the most important thing, global banking and, and fiat rails. You know, if we do nothing but make it really easy and fast and cheap to convert any fiat currency anywhere in the world into your favorite gas token to get that into your wallet, and we do that as cheaply, as fastly as possible, then we've done our job pretty well. But in order to do that, you really need that compliance po component nailed down. And if you take a look at, you know, any wallet or, or any, um, you know, any team that doesn't have this compliance component nailed down, you go look at the fees or the latency or, or the size restrictions. It's crazy. Like, not to pick on anybody in, in particular, but like it's not like, you know, we should not be charging users like the, the, the fees that are, you know, that some of these products are charging. <laughs> right. And it's because they don't have that piece. Um, and, and so really in order to do this well, you really need to solve that really hard problem. And there's no shortcut to it. You really need to hook up into kind of that that system and, and you know, be able to do things like international wire transfers. And, and that's super important to build a great product. Uh, but then you look at co companies like Circle. Circle is one of my favorite examples of this where, yeah, I mean, they don't call themselves an exchange, but they do a lot of the same stuff as an exchange. They have this you know, really challenging compliance problem. They have this great custody solution and they combine these things, these things together to tokenize fiat. Right, where they take this asset from the traditional you know, economy and they bridge it over as USDC into the crypto economy. And that creates a 10x better product, something that truly has product market fit that just creates a great service for the world. And, and, and I think that's like a really great example of how a lot of this stuff can be used in a really effective way to just 
build great stuff that's just groundbreaking for the world. Um, and so I think that compliance piece and, and this role that this, you know, crypto native financial institution, as I like to call it, um, is, is, is just super important for folks that really care about the crypto economy. And I think we're very much trying to fill that role. And so, yeah, that's kind of like how we're oriented and we're really trying to, to uh, provide that service. When you talk about this link between TradFi Rails uh, and Crypto Rails, it actually reminds me a bit of the analogy of uh, AOL at the beginning of um, the internet, where basically they were just having these walled gardens. Uh, they didn't really want people to actually leave the AOL site and go off into the wider internet. And it's a little bit like that at the moment with the centralized exchanges with Binance and whatnot. They just want to keep you on Binance. But the way that you are doing it and uh, sort of how Circle, I suppose, integrate into crypto products, uh, you're trying to like unleash people onto crypto rails far more seamlessly, predominantly in, in your case by having it all as part of the, the same app. So you can have, you know, all of your crypto stuff in one tab and then another tab uh, being the centralized exchange. Um, is, is that what you see potentially happening with this app that is just going to really help uh, seamlessly flow users uh, from TradFi Rails basically onto crypto rather than staying within the walled garden? Absolutely. I, I absolutely love the way you frame that. I think that's totally what uh, what we're trying to do. And I think if you look at the app, you, you really see that, right? Where the, the UX of the exchange is actually, it's the same wallet UX as, as, as the self-custodial wallet. Um, and, and, and it's really making it seamless to go back and forth between those two worlds, I think is something that we really want to do really well. And so, yeah, I, t I totally, that, that, that sentiment is very much shared uh, with us and it's how we kind of view the product. Uh, a follow-up question on, on that, because what you're seeing right now with the, with the centralized exchanges, Coinbase put out base this summer. They have the wallet, Coinbase wallet, uh, which is a pretty, I guess, seamless way to go between fiat and on-chain applications. Then now OKX is doing something with an L1. Um, Kraken rumored to be doing this to, or sorry, with an L2. Kraken's doing an L2. So from their perspective, they've always been these centralized beasts and they want to get more on chain you've always been on chain you grew up on chain and now you're doing the centralized exchange um talk to us a bit about like to your point how the product is going to look it seems like you're trying to make this look like you're already on chain but in the background you guys did all this hard work to actually make those rails pretty seamless um is that kind of the vision for this yeah, I mean, I view the exchange, honestly, as like another network. Um, and so, it's, I mean, it's quite literally a private, you, I mean, if you want to call it a private blockchain, it's like another network. Um, and so when you actually, so you see that in the app when you're, you're picking Solana, Ethereum, or, or, or the exchange. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know how to interpret a lot of the, the, the trend of exchanges moving to L2s or creating their own L2s. Like I think, I mean, OKX, Coinbase, Bybit, uh, Binance, they all have their own, their own networks now. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I don't really have a good sense. I, I, I think, I mean, rollups are certainly a w w one approach. Um, I think, I guess it's just, cha it's challenging to see how that'll play out because it's, because these are like, and Coinbase is a great example of this, right? I mean, Coinbase is an incredible institution. I have so much respect for what they've done. They're like the shining bright, light of compliance and, and high integrity in, in the US. And I really just, yeah, I just respect the, that that whole institution a ton. Um, but I guess base really confuses me as a, as a, as a, I don't know, as, as somebody mm -hmm. looking at both these worlds, because it's, it's supposed to be like a blockchain, right? It's supposed to be like decentralized and you're not, you have DeFi and all these things in there, right? Uh, but it's run by a centralized institution that needs to be regulated and compliant. So it feels like in this really awkward middle ground to me, right? Where versus my view of the world. Um, and again, I'm not like picking on, on the base team. I just, I just honestly don't know, or it's kind of like conflicts with my, my view of the world, which is, you know, I, th I feel like you'll be on one or two sides of the spectrum. Either you'll be totally decentralized, um, fully private, fully private, totally decentralized, no single point of failure, nobody that controls anything, nobody that can single handedly halt the system, nobody that has upgrade keys, nobody that controls the token distribution. And this applies for L1s, it applies for L2s, it applies for token projects. Um, I view it like, you know, you either extremely decentralized, 
maximally decentralized or you're totally centralized and you're compliant with every every rule, every regulation, every law. And you're just like any other kind of financial institution in the world and with, you know, just a, a fintech company built on, on crypto rails. And I feel like that is the end state for basically all crypto product products. Um, and so like what we've done, right, is we've gone to both extremes and we for each product, whether it's a wallet or whether it's the exchange, we do not sacrifice the integrity of the other. Right, the wallet. We don't track the wallet. We don't, you know, throw them into a database. We don't. Uh, we don't ask the user for information. Right, the wallet's the wallet. Right, it's a great wallet. Um, similarly, on the exchange, right, we're not playing fly fast and loose. We um, have an incredible compliance team, and we go through great efforts and create a lot of stress to have a very rigorous uh, uh, adherence to the, the, the rules in, in, in all the countries that we that we serve users in, and. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really know exactly how that'll play out, um, but I think, um, I think, you know, the charitable view, and I think this is true, is that things like base will certainly expose people to a lot of crypto tooling, which I think is an incredible thing. I think Coinbase has probably onboarded more people to self custody than the majority of decentralized apps, maybe all decentralized apps, if we're being honest. Um, so, you know, major kudos to. And, and flowers, if you want to use that term, uh, to, 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 <laughs> that, to those guys. Uh, it's great stuff. Yeah, I think the L2 strategy, to me, it just screams that it's part of this walled garden strategy as well, that they, they've got you in the um, centralized exchange, and then they want you to go and use their decentralized uh, L2. They don't want you to sort of go off and, and just use crypto at large. So to me, it's it's just trying to maximize value capture, basically. Whereas you're going about it in a different way. You're You're not saying, I want to own you know, an SVM roll up and that's where you should live. You're saying you, you're the sort of part of the journey you want to own is the the wallet itself, which to me makes far more sense. And then just sort of let people go off and explore where they, where they choose. Um, one thing I wanted to raise was the, it's really part of your go to market strategy, which is using mad lads. Suddenly you've got this, you know, fervent ecosystem of thousands of people um, basically doing free advertising for uh, the exchange and it feels to me like maybe the first truly i don't know intelligent use of nfts maybe and of the marketing potential that they have uh, where it's for a, a real product uh, coming to market rather than just the advertising being the nft itself um so yeah if you could just tell us more about your mad Lads strategy um yeah so i think one of two things is going to happen with the history of mad lads they're either going to write business books about this or <laughs> <laughs> or it's going to be known as like the, the 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 silliest idea ever, and we never should have done it, and it was a big mistake. Um, I think in either case, we're having a ton of fun, and we've met a lot of incredible people, and it's just like a really a rabid, just incredible bunch of of people around the world. And so, you know, maybe it's a win win regardless. Um, but ultimately, Mad Lads has always been, you know, um, I mean, it's a community, right? And they're you know, simultaneously a community of people with their own um, agendas, their own interests, their own incentives, uh, the, their own things that they care about and that they do. Um, and then, you know, they're also kind of uh, customers, right? And, 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 and folks that we, that we build stuff for. And, and like the way that I describe it, and this might sound kind of silly, is just like, you know, they're just like, you know, 10,000 of our, of our, you know, closest friends on the internet. Um, and when your friends do cool stuff, uh, you tend to want to support them. Um, and if your friends do really well, um, you, you know, you tend to be happier um, in whatever way you, you live your life, right? Um, you know, and, and, and I think that is like emotionally, I think how, how we feel about it. And, and um, it makes for a really, you know, terrific way, I think, to build a product. I mean, there's all sorts of negative things that you can point at, right? It's like you, you know, no matter what you do, whether it's crypto or, you know, a traditional Silicon Valley company, right? There's always going to be people that are like, you know, making you stressed out, you know, whether they're people asking you to do a token or, or they're people asking you to, you know, uh, do something, you know, I don't know what, 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 you know, somebody like, you know, uh, Sam Alton deals with or whatever, not to compare myself to him. He's just like the first figure in, 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 in Silicon Valley that came to my head. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's a pros and cons, right? And and, and I think it's it's just been terrific to just like be, being able to go to a Discord and be like, hey, guys, what do you think of this? Should we do this? Do you like this? Does this make your life better? Um, and, and to have some smiles along the way. And I think that has just been really just tons of fun. And I think... Honestly, we just try to mix all those kind of things together, right? It's like a combination. It's like a weird combination of just like maximum fun, um, maximum just like, you know, 
uh, product feedback and also trying to just make people's lives better. And I think um, it's like, why build alone when you can build with other people and having a, a symbol in the form of a piece of artwork to represent that collective, I don't know, brand, vision, alignment, whatever you want to call it, is really a, a great way to, 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 to go to market. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of maybe a, a bit about how I think about it. So I think obviously you're kind of like a mainstay of the Solana ecosystem and certainly a lot of people view this move with the exchange and, and pretty much everything you've ever built, even just dating back to the dev tooling as like, yes, this is going to help Solana accomplish more. How are you thinking about though? Cause, cause I, I never believed in monogamous relationships with blockchains. Like they're just tools to do things on. Um, and certainly I think Solana is the most technically robust approach uh but you can't ignore the capital on eth so <clears throat> it, it, with respect to the exchange like are, are you guys going to support you know all kinds of tokens do you expect this to be an on-ramp just to crypto broadly um because i do remember it, when backpack even first dropped it i believe it either teased at eth support or it did support eth um and so, like, how do you think about that? How do you think about the, the Ethereum ecosystem and how this kind of dovetails into into that world? It's funny because everybody on Solana thinks I'm an ETH maxi and then everybody on ETH thinks I'm a Solana maxi. So I'm like in this weird middle ground where I have no <laughs> friends. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but um, I think luckily, the, the at least the, the, the folks that have been in both ecosystems for a while are all pretty kind to people and there's not a lot of maximalism i think amongst the builders but um no so, i mean backpacks had eth support since the beginning uh, i started my crypto career on eth um i have a lot of friends on eth um it's a super important ecosystem it'll i don't think it'll ever go away um i think obviously solana is close to my heart it's, you know, I would call it like a second home for me, friends and family kind of thing. Um, it's an awesome ecosystem. Um, it's we've just gone through so much as a company, as a community at the Mad Lutz level, at the Solana level. Um, I, yeah, I just have so much admiration and, and respect for um, folks in both ecosystems. I'm obviously like spend a lot of time in Solana and that's like very much our starting point, right? It's the the people we spend the most time with. Um, but we want to build products for, for the entire world, right? Um, I think it would be a disservice to Solana to like ever be a maximalist. Um, I think the reason why I worked on Solana in the first place is because I cared about other blockchains, right? It's like, by definition, I went to Solana because I'm not a maxi. Um, <laughs> and, and so like the whole maximalism thing is kind of dumb to me. I think, I think the whole um, what's alignment meme is just so <laughs> absurd. Um, yeah. Like I get it. People have like incentives. You see this amongst like developers and like, you know, web two, right? Everybody cares about like, you know, react or view or, you know, chakra yeah. or tailwind or whatever, you know, flavor of the day it is. Um, obviously in crypto, it's much more potent because of the, the financial element. Um, right. But it's all silly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not aligned with, with anything other than just awesome people building cool stuff on the internet. Um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, we love Solana. Um, it's a second home. We're building awesome stuff for the network. We hope to expand to Ethereum. Um, I don't know what to, an to how to answer that question other than, yeah, people are awesome. Build up stuff for awesome people. For sure. How, I do think well that do like think... a lot of the exchanges do fade Solana, though, um, and they, kind of yeah. treat it as a second-class citizen. Um, I think we see that pretty clearly. Um, and you see it in terms of listings. You seem to see it in terms of public sentiment. Um, you see it in terms of just like how they communicate publicly about problems in the space. Um, I think a lot of the engineering work on Solana is just like so foreign to people for whatever reason yeah. that they just don't believe it's true. They think there's like some weird shortcut or something. And it's like, <laughs> no, it's just like really impressive engineering work and you should give it a chance. And um, I think from that point of view, we certainly want to be an exchange that, um, you know, alignment again is just such a dumb word, but we're just, you know, <laughs> You know, we, we definitely love Solana and, and we want to support it and in yeah. and, and ways that other exchanges don't. It's our best shot to get a ton of capital into Solana through Fiat Rails. That's always been one of the biggest headwinds I've seen. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, we totally respect this 
adding that to the the fray of tools that people have to onboard how do you think about um abstracting away some of the complexities um because obviously you're going to have centralized exchange you're going to have the solana rails and then you're going to have all of these you know at the very least eth rails maybe the l2 rails um do you think wallets have gone as far as they can or do you have plans in the future to try and further abstract it away? And, and also tagged onto that, can you imagine a future where you can just sort of do something on the centralized exchange and then it's going to come onto the decentralized stuff and it's all going to happen in one transaction? Is that all part of the future as well? So I think you have to think about it in terms of like, what does the end state of all these crypto networks look like? And my sense is that there will be a couple things that happen. I'm just speculating here, but it, here's my sense. My sense is that there will be a, a small number of very high valuable, of high value um, general execution layers. So things like Solana, what Ethereum originally was, um, what it is today, but I don't know if it'll continue to be this way, um, but where there's the maximum amount of shared state that can be atomically uh, composed with each other. And the reason for that is that it's great UX um, and uh, it's, you know, people want to have shared state on the same system and there's network effects in that. Uh, and it's really hard to build these decentralized networks and the more, you know, th there'll just be network effects and it'll be, if you want to build an unbreakable world computer, I think there's probably only going to be a couple of these things. Um, so I think I think there will be a small number of those. Right now, it's basically Solana and it's uh, Ethereum. Um, and then there will be ecosystem specific or, you know, app chains. I, I love the Cosmos view of the world. Um, I've always loved Cosmos because I always felt like it was very like, to, in my view, like very intellectually honest for like, you know, a lot of, a lot of things like, oh, of course there's going to be multiple chains, right? We want different chains for different use cases. Um, I would argue Bitcoin is an app specific chain, right? It was built for cash. I mean, it's not cash now, but it, it's a store of value now. And it's the most important store of value, I think in the, in the world. Uh, but uh, that, that is like a singular use case, right? Whether you're storing, you know, uh, Bitcoin uh, to store value or ordinals in terms of art, it's really like a specific, very specific ecosystem uh, versus like a, a, you know, a general purpose computer like, like Solana. Um, and this is totally the, the roadmap of, of Ethereum and Celestia and of others, right? They want to be a settlement layer so that all these rollups kind of build on top. And the problem with that well, there's, there's trade-offs. There's trade-offs in everything. There's no perfect solution. Um, but th the downside of that is, well, each roll-up roll is fragmented. And so, you know, composing the state of roll-ups between each other is very difficult. Um, that's not particularly insightful. Maybe there's some theoretical solution to this that people will point to like a blog post or paper about. But as far as I can tell, I haven't seen any kind of implementations of this um, where they can actually abstract away that complexity. So you basically have different blockchains for, for each, uh, each roll-up. Um, I, I could be wrong there. I'm not super up to date with the with the modern like roll up research but that's i look at a roll up and i'm like okay from a ux point of view the user sees a different blockchain whether it's optimism arbitrum or, or polygon or whatever polygon i guess technically isn't a roll up but you know you know what i mean they're different blockchains um and so that's going to create fragmentation and so none of those systems will ever be as valuable as as eth or mainnet or as solana because they're fragmented, they're all competing with each other. Um, and, and they're not going to ever be as decentralized or scale in the same way that like, a, you know, Ethereum or, or Solana will. Um, and so what you'll see with rollups is purpose built chains. In the event of in the case of like base, I suspected it'll be like, you know, finance, DeFi or whatever, um, you might have app specific chains for, you know, a game, for example, um, or, you know, specific use cases like, um, I don't know, like if, if, if you might have a consortium of banks, I want to use, uh, you know, a, a roll up as a as a, you know, internal bookkeeping keep, mechanism, um, you know, whatever it is. And, um, and, and, and so that's kind of the view of the world. And so to circle back to your question, right, how does this translate in a wallet UX? Uh, if you have a couple high value 
general purpose chains with all the value in it. Um, and then you have a long tail of application specific chains. Well, then that basically means you have apps and it means you have a couple of base layers that you settle into uh, or, or that you use actively for apps. And so um, I think there's two you know, ramifications of this. The first ramification is, well, to handle the base layers, you kind of need UX maybe similar to what we have today in Backpack. We have a couple of chains that are highlighted um, as the main use cases, and you drive users there, and they have their assets, and, and you have a wallet user experience. But then for all the roll-ups and all the app chains, right, it's an app. So in the same way you use Venmo, right, when you use Venmo, what do you do? The first thing, you go into the app, and you deposit money from your bank. You use Plaid to, to transfer money in and out. But it's a deposit and a withdrawal interface. It's the same thing as an exchange. And app chains, rollups, whatever, you, similar UX, right? You're going into an app, you're depositing money into the system, and you're withdrawing money out of the system. And that's like convenient UX that we all know, right? You're, um, and, and, and so I think that is kind of more or less how we're structuring the wallet and kind of how we view the world. So I hope that answers the question, the UX question. <laughs> Um, so you brought up a good point actually in that answer that I want to dive into a bit, um, or a couple things rather. Uh, the first is, and you kind of alluded to this, L2s or even app chains in the Cosmos ecosystem, the <laughs> utility that is always posited is that you can customize it to your app. What I find, just taking that to the extreme, is I don't, I've never heard of a really good reason to have an app chain other than if you're doing something like a order book perp dex that needs like a tendermint blockchain, like the needs, the performance guarantees of that. Other than that, it feels to me like you could probably just do this on the L1, like Solana, at least like a fast L1. Um, you know, and so it ju it's just odd. It's just odd that it almost feels like it's, it's just a pitch to get people to use the chain rather than thinking from first principles. Like why would you want to have a separate chain to do something? I mean, is that kind of, how you view it uh, from what i see at least it's either control or hey you know we have an l2 so you just build here because we raise a lot of money and we're going to give you some money and you know it's, everyone's happy <laughs> how, how do you view that yeah yeah so i think I, I mean i agree with the sentiment that it's a lot of work to run your own l2 it's a lot of or your own app chain um mm -hmm. and i think I mean, one way to put it is just in the programming model terms, right? One is serverless. It's very easy. You just write a little smart contract, Solidity, Rust, whatever. You throw it on the chain, it just works. Like that is a yep. great programming model. It is an incredible opportunity to leverage your skills as a developer to do the minimum amount of work for the maximum amount of value. It's a great experience. Um, but on the other hand, you have building your own blockchain, right? Even if you use something like Tendermint, which makes it really easy. The Cosmos SDK is awesome. Uh, you still have to do, do that hard work of running those validators. And then depending on what you're doing, you know, you, may, you might not want that to be centralized. You might want it to be decentralized. In the event that it's decentralized, oh my goodness, you have yeah. a whole other problem. And that is so difficult. Um, so it really depends on, on, on what you're doing. Uh, I think there are certainly use cases like an exchange is the perfect use case where you really just need control. Where if you want, especially if it's centralized, that, that's a great use case, like for private blockchains, for example. Um, and, and so I think it really depends. But I think there are examples where, well, you grow so big, right? You outgrow the, 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 the network and you need to go onto your own chain. Um, and I think that is certainly would be the case for companies like Facebook or Instagram um, or, you know, even something like Pith, right? Pith has its own um, L2, or I don't know what you call it. It's its own app chain, but it uses Solana's uh, virtual machine. I think they're one of the first ones to really have that in production. Um, and I mean, I, I haven't spoken with the Pith team about it, but I could only assume it's because they're just doing so much on the network that yeah. they are just literally sending just tons of transactions where eventually you outgrow it, right? And, and, and so I think that is, you know, uh, one reason as well. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's a pretty reasonable use case. That's actually a really good analogy is if you're just building on the L1 as a developer, if you're offloading all of the complexity, the DevOps complexity to an AWS or what have you, if you're not, you know, it's like you're building in 2001 where you're just, you're setting up the servers, you're communicating, setting up the databases, handling all the connections to the internet, 
all the syncing. It's just an insane amount of overhead um, to want to take on. I mean, it's a lot of extra glass to chew. Um, <clears throat> one other thing I wanted to touch on, at least, you know, during this uh, chat we're having with you is uh, XNFTs. I mean, they were super, it was like the hot announcement of last breakpoint. And, you know, I would say, at least from my perspective, adoption probably isn't quite where where maybe a lot of us thought it would be. Um, what's been your read on that situation? Uh, this idea of putting code on chain, tokenizing code, and executed and executing it inside the wallet. What have, what have been your learning so far from that experiment? So I think I think a couple of things. So the first thing is that XNFTs really are great. It's really great UX. It's really what made the Mad Lads Mint so special. It basically turns the NFT into into a into a, a into an app, basically, right? It's like you solve all the token gating right then and there. But I think there's two challenges that need need to be overcome for it. Um, so the first challenge is really uh, the ability for creators to build them without engineers. So it, it's a very it's a very uh, low level primitive, right? It's like go build an app. And that's hard for, for NFTs to do, right? We were able to do it as mad lads, right? But your average NFT kind of project, it'd be pretty hard for them to do. Um, and, and, and so that's that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, is distribution, right? XNFTs really are valuable, you know, you know, uh, proportional to the distribution of, of the wallet or the platform. And so you really have to solve that problem. Because once you have that distribution, then you are able to build network effects, right? You have people that will build the XNFTs for the platform. And then you have the people that will use the XNFTs because all the cool XNFTs are, are on the platform, right? Whether it's Solana or it's a wallet or whatever. Um, and, and I think that's really a, a tough chicken egg problem. And I, I think um, I, I think the, the, those are really the, the two reasons that I would describe that or that make it that make it challenging. Um, and then the third reason, which I think is the other really important reason is mobile, um, where it's really hard to get, you know, Apple to be okay with it. Um, I think the way that we have gone about it is basically to treat them like websites um, so that it's, you know, it's, it's the exact same UX as, as a DAP browser. Um, it's kind of like a shortcut for getting in there. Um, but I think those are kind of the high level kind of, that's, that would be like my, my take. And I think, you know, everything that we're doing with the exchange um, and obviously with Mad Lads, I think just creates more primitives that we can bring to XNFT developers. So it's, it's a bit of a tough line to toe, but I think ultimately um, we the wallet is like the, it's a key management system, but ultimately it's like the financial service provider for application developers. Um, and, and that's kind of like the way we see the, the end state of that ecosystem that we want to build out. Do you think that they're broadly, I don't know, equivalent to PWAs, which we saw popularized by FriendTech? Um, because obviously there's also been Saga where with their own app store. I think Android app store maybe has started accepting um, crypto apps. So yeah, just wondering how it compares, I suppose, to traditional app stores and how it would compare to PWA and what are the sort of uh, additional features which can be leveraged? I think there's two things that are interesting about it or two problems that they solve. Um, the first is in the case where you want a decentralized app, you, you need a decentralized front end. And a great example of this is something like Uniswap, where you have a decentralized protocol that's controlled by nobody and, and used all around the world. Um, some immutable smart contracts. I actually don't know the status of, of Uniswap's immutability. I, I, I'm guessing it's immutable just based on what I know about the team, but you know, don't take my word as truth. Um, I, I actually don't know. Um, but, but, but that is a great example of like a pretty, very simple front end that makes a ton of sense to tokenize, put on a blockchain and have that distribution of that app uh, controlled by a decentralized uh, token. Right or an NFT, if you want to put it in those terms, um, and, and 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 I think that is the first thing. If you need a decentralized front end, um, where you really have this serverless programming model, where the back end is just a smart contract, right? And, and if you're in this world where everything is decentralized, you have to tokenize the UI. Um, otherwise, it's centralized. You somebody go take it down, and 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 that is um, that's a point of failure. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing 
is really about token gating. Um, and Mad Lads may be the best example of this, where in order for you to, uh, we have this staking mechanism for Mad Lads where you click on the Mad Lad and you can stake it and basically lock it up and um, accumulates, uh, it's like World of Warcraft gold. We have, we, we, took, we, we took it, uh, the, the inspiration from there is a like copper, silver, gold, and diamond. And it's just a point system that's bound to your wallet that is basically tracking your loyalty to the community, right? It's a loyalty tracker, basically. Um, and th the NFT literally is the app. It's like a bearer. Um, it's like a bearer app, if you want to put it in those terms. Um, and I think on that primitive, you can build really cool stuff. Um, and, and that's just, you know, engineering work that's like needs to be done. It's like this, but going back to what I keep saying, right? There's all these cool ideas, but like, you know, actually few people that will actually go execute on them. Um, but, but a cool example of this is this soul abstraction idea that I came up with a bit ago. Um, I, 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 I wrote a thread on Twitter and kind of explained the idea. Uh, but basically what you could think about is airdropping and a primitive to airdrop programming instructions onto, onto wallets. And that's a really cool abstract primitive that you can build stuff on. Um, where, for example, if I wanted to build like um, a rewards platform, or maybe I'm a, uh, maybe I'm like a pizza shop, or maybe I'm a, uh, a clothing company, or maybe I'm like Coachella, and, and I want to advertise to like an NFT. Maybe it's an entire community at once. Maybe it's a specific NFT because I, I saw what they were doing on the blockchain and thought it was relevant. And well, I can airdrop a, an app to you basically um, where you can open up that app and do stuff with it, right? And you can do that all through the blockchain. It's a delivery mechanism. Um, and I think I think these types of, of use cases really are underexplored. And I think um, th these are really the two primitives that, that you get, right? It's like decentralized um, front ends and bearer uh, programmability. Uh, and I think those are really the two kind of value propositions to lean into, uh, with the XNFT experiment that are, that, you know, we would love to continue to explore as time goes on. Oh, that's awesome. Um, one, one actually topic I wanted to, to dig into is because you're, you you founded a lot of things that are pretty different. Um, one is just like, do you have any advice for founders maybe they're crypto but maybe not in just figuring out what gets them going what gets them curious what to focus on it looks like you started off doing a lot of open source projects and maybe you weren't didn't have the intention to turn that into a company um, but eventually a lot of people found it useful and, and you did um, like how did you figure out this is what i want to work on and kind of kept pushing through because you guys went through a lot <laughs> uh, of headwinds uh, especially with the ftx thing but i'm sure certainly a lot of others just having been in solana for so long uh, tell us a bit about that so i think i mean th th there's a bunch of ways you can take this conversation i think the most i mean it, it's not super i mean it's i guess it's common advice in the startup kind of world but i think um i think i might have heard brian armstrong say this i saw somebody say this yeah. where it, he basically said just go do stuff like it doesn't matter what it is just go do it because action just like provides information and when you get more information you can get more insight and do more interesting things and so whenever these types of questions come up i basically like to tell people well you know just it doesn't matter just go do it if you want to build a wallet go build a wallet it doesn't matter that there's like a million wallets right um because when you're in that process you know our our wallet led to a bunch of stuff right like the xnfts led the mad lads um it, it, you know even the exchange to, to to some extent like um you know it, it, allow, it allowed us to get out into the world and and communicate with people um where you know people you know came to us and said oh i want to do x y and z with you right um and that all came from just action and so that's maybe the first thing right it's just like go do stuff it's super tempting to want to i mean to want to be inside your you know apartment just like you know researching and reading research papers or playing you know video games or you know getting inspiration whatever way you get the inspiration um but it's you really got to be out there in the world um and, and and executing in public um so yeah i don't know it, on the if the question is how do you get inspiration and creativity I think the the answer it's tempting to want to think of oneself as like fundamentally an intrinsically creative person, but I think at least the way I work, I, I suspect many humans work this way is more, you know, uh, reactive or it's as much reactive as it is, you know, um, introspective. 
where you really need to be out there bumping shoulders with people and feeding off of the energy of people to really kind of get, you know, inspired and, 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 and learn what to do. Do you think your past has had any influence on you just being in crypto? I know you just brought up in the previous question, uh, like some analogies to World of Warcraft. I find that a lot of people in crypto, including myself, I used to play RuneScape back in the day, um, played a lot of MMOs and you just kind of learn about markets and digital items, digital gold and things like that. Uh, so I feel like it probably influenced me for sure. Like I just grasp things a lot quicker, especially NFTs. Um, have you found that to be the case for you? Yeah, totally. I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm a huge World of Warcraft nerd. I love World of Warcraft. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't, you know, if left to my own devices, I'd just be playing World of Warcraft all day probably. But uh, I'm lucky I'm not left to my own devices. Uh, I think it's only totally had an influence. I think, I think creating online community and bonds and making friends with people all around the world that you've never met before, but you feel like you know them deeply and intimately. It's like, that's, that's all world of Warcraft stuff. Like it's such a social game and it's very much the same. It's weird to say, I guess I never thought about this. It's the same thing that we're doing with like crypto on crypto Twitter and, it is. and in yeah. NFT and stuff and building these communities, right? It's like a guild. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a really cool kind of thing to think about. And I think you're right. There's something there. There's, there's some pattern matching here that I'm noticing. Love it. Um, and Armani, maybe as a closing question, but um, you, you've pushed us back twice. So um, maybe in return, what's the alpha? What, what should we be looking forward to? <laughs> uh, what should we look out for uh, going forwards? Yeah, great question. So, so I mean, this, this, I assume this isn't going to go out before uh, tonight. Um, but yeah, we're looking to launch the exchange like very soon. I'm um, looking to, you know, within the next week, basically, and looking to list uh, the first markets. And, and we're super excited uh, to kind of get the ball rolling. There's tons of really important work to do and a lot of work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're, we're yeah. getting that ball rolling this week. And that's probably the most exciting thing happening. Amazing. I think a lot of us are looking forward to this. Um, it's been I don't know. It's been a long year since <laughs> since Solana collapsed uh, and then bounced back post FTX, and it's it's a weird kind of story arc that I think I'm just seeing in all these publications. But you know, it's a rebirth in, in some ways. Um, so you know, we're we're super looking forward to everything that's going to come out of, of Backpack Exchange. I appreciate all your contributions to crypto and the ecosystem. It's it's truly just incalculable. And uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for telling us about your journey, your story, what you're working on and joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you next time.